All right, good morning. Welcome back to Twin Stick Garage. So on today's episode, I wanted to work on my pride and joy here, the truck I've named little by little. So it's a 79 359 Peterbilt. I dragged it out of a field probably, I don't know, five years ago, and it's kind of what started this whole this whole channel and this whole Twin Stick Garage thing and this whole collection of, of semi-trucks. So what I wanted to do today is picking up where I left off in the last episode. Obviously, I took this truck outside. I used some paint stripper and then tried to knock as much paint off of it as I could while it was outside, try and keep the dust down in the shop, and then I backed it in. And now what I want to do today is to try and take the bunk and lift it up off of the truck and set it back so I can properly do the body work on the front of the bunk and then obviously the back of the cab because otherwise you just can't reach in there. And it's just not going to look good if I leave it where it is. So that's the plan today. Let's try and get that going and uh, build some momentum and see if I can't get this thing one step closer to getting painted. I mentioned it a lot that the best kind of work is rework and obviously I'm joking. It, uh, it kind of sucks to have to, to redo something that you've already done but I did this truck kind of in the wrong order. I didn't really think it through when I was building it. I mean obviously I started a long time ago when I was still outside. First truck I ever rebuilt I never really thought of doing it in, in, a, in a proper order where one thing leads to another. So no big deal. It uh, can always unring this bell. There's not a lot for a, for a bunk, especially these older ones that are an air ride. There's only actually three bolts. So there's one there, one there, and then one in the center, focus, one right there in the back. Now I did add a little bit of wiring for some LED lights, but thankfully I actually never uh, ran the wiring from the cab to the bunk. So I don't need to, to cut all of that out because I never did it. And then there's a couple of uh, coolant lines to come from the engine and then up into the heater core for the bunk heater. So I'll have to, I actually put some uh, valves, I think I did anyway, uh, some shutoff valves up on the engine when I replaced all the coolant lines. So that shouldn't be too hard of a task. And then I'm just gonna pick it with my Gratz gantry. I'll just put a chain fall on this side. I don't know, I'll maybe grab, grab onto something like this and then run a strap around. Obviously I'm not too worried about the paint at this point, but my concern will be is when it's all nicely painted, setting it back on the, the proper spot without wrecking the paint. But I'm pretty sure I can accomplish that. I mean, I was able to, to load this thing on or uh, install this thing on here with a, with a greasy old heister forklift that didn't have any brakes. So there you go, one sleeper. But unfortunately I did damage it. Uh, I came in a bit crooked and ended up catching in a couple spots. Look at that, I caught the I caught the stupid thing. I didn't even know it was going on while I was getting it in there, so that is a bummer. But I actually gouged the uh, the bunk on these little mounts that run the, the lines up to the condenser that were on the roof. I just kind of caught those and <laughs> scraped into it, which was kind of crappy. But even though when I bought this bunk and it was nicely painted, I was never gonna be able to match the paint to the bunk because of course it had faded from the sun so the only real way to do this is to paint it all at the same time now back then i originally thought i don't know how to paint the truck i'm gonna have to take it to a body shop and then i'll drop all the chrome off or maybe they'll drop all the chrome off and then get it painted but when i found out how much it cost to actually paint these things like in the order of magnitude like 20 to thirty thousand, i ended up just painting this one myself it turned out half decent so now i've got a little more confidence to paint this one as well but uh, not only do I have to do the stuff underneath, I actually have to, there's a rubber seal, if you can see it in there, obviously keeps the rain and the uh, snow and everything else and the weather out of the, out of the truck, but that's underneath the interior. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to undo this, uh, take the rubber seal out. Yeah, it's going to be a bit of work, which is a, a crying shame, but sometimes you got to go, you know, one step forward to go or one step back to go two steps forward. 
So with that, I guess I'll stop talking and start working and see if I can't get this bunk moved back and like I say, move the truck forward to one step closer to getting painted. Now, unfortunately, I didn't back the truck in far enough to have the hood open while the door is closed. So I need to back up just a little bit further before I put this thing away for the winter. Oh, this cat starts so good. smoke air out or blow out and then we can get going all right so i was actually smart enough to put some shutoff valves on the lines there that go back to the bunk because the coolant system in the uh, in these big trucks holds about uh, give or take about 14 gallons of coolant so it's a lot of head pressure that if you release one of the lines it'll all leak out of there so now that those are isolated i should be able to disconnect the lines underneath here that go to this heater core in the bunk and then I'll, I got a pail so it shouldn't take that much I'm thinking maybe just a couple liters because it'll be whatever was in the heater core and then just sitting in the lines so we'll go ahead and give that a go all right so I know this looks like amateur hour here but uh, essentially what this is is I just never had enough time to finish finish up the wiring so I ran some new wires because the temperature sensors up on the dash uh, were not working or not connected for the the temperature um, for the front and rear diffs and the front and rear transmissions. So I just ran some extra wire down from the dash. I just never had a chance to hook it up. These are all the wires for the bunk. So this will be, you know, the radio, the left and right speakers, um, the controlling of the, the heater controls, the HVAC controls inside there and probably some other interior lights. So I need to connect all of these lines to all the wires that are in this harness, uh, but I never did that. So at least I don't have to cut that. So don't worry, this will get finished eventually, even though it looks pretty, pretty ratty right now. So as I was mentioning, I got those shutoff valves closed. So hopefully that'll hold all the coolant in the, uh, around the engine and in the radiator. But there is still gonna be coolant from the heater core and then whatever's in these lines. And then I've also realized that as soon as I pop this line off, all the coolant that's up in this heater core, probably at least a liter, is gonna come pouring out of there. So this is gonna make a bit of a mess. But a good friend of mine, actually, he saw me struggling when I replaced all the coolant lines. So he sent me a set of these pincher pliers. And what these essentially do is, now you can use, you can use vice grips to pinch a line, but then vice grips can kinda of, um, tear, potentially tear into the line and ruin the line. So these kinda of have the, the soft flat edge on there. And essentially all you do is just Put it over the center of the line, and clamp it down, and that should keep it from leaking. I mean, it still might sweat out of there, but it'll pinch it off enough to allow you to get it into a pail and then, and then dump it out. Okay, that wasn't as dramatic as I thought it was gonna be. Oh, there we go. Uh, well, I guess it wasn't too big of a mess. Okay, now let's open this up and finish the job. Not too bad at all. Okay. Well, glad that's done. Now on to the next task. Now I remember what a chore these were to put in there because there's just a little window up in here to get the wrench on. I can't recall if I made a, a custom short wrench to fit in there. I may have. Alright, so to get at the, the last bolt there. I got to get this pogo stick mount out of the way. There we go. All 
<laughs> okay, we'll just settle it down like that. Now, oh, this is gonna be tricky because I can't get the impact in there. Yeah. Gonna have to do this one by hand. The three bolts are undone now. I've cut the wires. I've got the coolant lines disconnected. So I think this thing is ready to pick and lift once I get the, the rubber seal out. So I guess now I'll start working in the interior here. So one thing I've learned with all these projects is you can never have enough containers. So you get yourself down to Harbor Freight or in Canada, Princess Auto and you get a bunch of those bins when they go on sale because they work, they're invaluable when you go and take stuff apart to try and keep it all organized in one spot. Now, I know for the loyal followers of the channel, they'll remember an episode where I went to a junkyard and I was looking for a uh, the big hole rings. What I'm up to today is I'm looking for, and these are the ones, these are the ones I need. These are called, uh, well basically I'm doing a big hole conversion and these are larger rings. And I found one of them, but I still haven't found the, the sleeper one. And the idea I was thinking of was actually doing a big hole conversion on this truck. And if I was gonna do it, now would be the time. And for those that don't know, a big hole conversion is, this is essentially, well, when bunks first started, they were crawl through openings. So they were kind of about here, and that was about the opening that you had, and you had to kind of crawl through and go into the bunk, just like the coffin bunk on the snowman truck. And then they realized that that was pretty hard on truckers, so then they started doing these larger openings that went all the way down to the floor, so you could kind of walk through into your bunk and then walk through back into the cab. So that was how they were for the uh, late 70s and then into most of the 80s. Then when Peterbilt went to the uh, the 379 in 87, they, they still had the small ones because it's actually a 379 bunk, an early 379 bunk. They still had this same size of opening, but then when they went to the air ride bunks, I don't know what year that would have been, probably in the 90s, they had a larger opening that went probably about all the way over to here and a little higher up so it was a larger opening. And the benefit of that was, for the people that are taller like myself, you could slide your seat back into the bunk and tilt your seat back in, so it gave a lot of leg room. Now, this is obviously a toy truck. It's not something that I'm, I suppose I could go long hauling if I wanted to by the time it gets finally rebuilt. But the even for the short drive that I do with this thing, it would still be a treat to be able to slide the the seat all the way back because right now I'm kind of driving it I'm kind of tucked right in behind the uh, behind the seat or behind the steering wheel so I may I may I might go back to that wrecker and see if he's got see if he's got one because we got the one ring we just need the other one and uh, and I may I may do that we'll see we'll see for now I'm just gonna try and get get the bunk off the truck and we'll go from there so there you can see the new rubber seal that I put in there. And then these two black rings squish it on the inside and outside there. Well, the inside of the, the cab and then the, the outside meaning the bunk. So there's these, these sections that need to come out of here. Oh, I remember doing all this work. As I started doing, ah, nice. There's a good outtake. Um, as I started doing this, I realized that I only need to break the seal on one edge because obviously when I lift this, 
the boot will come with it and can just stay in the uh, in the bunk. Ugh, man. But I was also thinking as I was in here, the if I did do the big hole conversion, it would take a heck of a lot of work because not only do I need to cut the cab and cut the bunk, but I'd have to cut into the interior and redo the interior because it's going to be like way over here. But I suppose I could. You just cut the the day cab company panel and I'd need a new boot though because I'd need a boot off of 379 the larger uh, larger boot and then I'd have to get the decap company to make another another shell so yeah I gotta have to I'm gonna have to noodle that one we'll see how ambitious I get but I think for now I think for now this can actually we can actually lift the bunk out so let's give that a try Yeah, yeah, I know it's not picked very straight, but it doesn't matter. I just needed to pick it to get it out of here. I'll come up with a better way to, uh, to rig it when I put it back, obviously. Tip it, aren't I? Okay, I need to re-rig this. There, that's rigged a little better. Uh, come on. <laughs> come on. What the heck am I caught on? Oh, I'm not too bright. I forgot the grounding strap. But no worries, that's an easy fix. Thing is though, what do they always say? Never, never go under a suspended load, so I'm gonna put something there just in case. We'll get this guy off of here. There, something like that. Isn't that the way it goes though? You think you got everything? It's kind of like when you pull an engine too. And I know I'm gonna, I'm gonna see that when I pull that old 301 in the Trans Am. You think you got everything and then when you start lifting it, you're like, oh yeah, I forgot that, I forgot that. Okay. Now let's see if we can bring this bunk back and set it down. Okay. Oh, look how good it rolls. Something like that should work. That's more than enough room. Okay. Something like that's looking pretty good. Yeah, I like that. Now, obviously I'm not gonna use chains when I have it painted. I'll, uh, I'll definitely use straps, but that should work good. Here, let me show you the front. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while since I've seen the, the front of that. Oh, there's even some more gouges I'm gonna have to fix. See, I never would have, been, would have been able to get at that and do that right without lifting it from the bunk. 
Yeah, and the notorious clamps that, that wrecked the bunk. <laughs> There's a shifter sticks. Ugh. Yeah, it's definitely the right way to do it. And the other benefit is going to be, like, obviously I'll have to tape this all up with plastic so I don't fill the cab full of dust and junk and paint. But the other benefit here is that way I can paint from the front and paint to the center line and then crawl up back here and paint from the center line back. And same thing on the bunk because this is a big 63 inch bunk. I'd never be able to reach all the way there. So I'll just kind of start in the middle, work my way back and then do the same thing on the, on the back side. Yeah, need a little bit of body work there. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Guess I'll put a, a platform here so I don't step through there and do some damage to my legs. But that's cool. Man, that was way easier and way more controlled with the gantry. So thanks again, Don, for, for building me that. That's exactly what that thing was built for, is for doing jobs like that. Cool. All right, so since it's a, such a nice fall day and it's not windy, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to cover up the old snowman trailer for winter. So I wanted to protect it from the elements, both the sun and the, the snow. So I got a, a tarp, what size did I get here? It's a hay tarp for covering bales. It's like uh, 33 by 48. So the trailer's only 45 feet long, so that'll give me a couple extra feet on each end. And then since it's a hay tarp, it's got nice heavy duty straps and the eyelets are stitched in a lot better than just a regular old tarp that you get from a hardware store. So what I was thinking of doing is just stitching it together underneath. So bringing these eyelets together and just going back and forth underneath and sucking the tarp down and then tie it together in the front here, covering up the reefer or the reefer shell and then tie it against the back and then to prevent flapping, because of course wind can still get underneath it, and to prevent this from flapping and smack it against the sticker, I thought what I might do is run some ropes up and over on the outside of the tarp, bring them together underneath, and then maybe ratchet strap them together, and just suck this thing tight against the trailer, and hopefully protect it from the elements, and make sure it looks just as good when I take this off and start driving this thing again next summer. There, something like that. It's gonna take a lot of rope. But before you say, oh, well, the trailer's too nice, it should be inside. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. But it's a, it's a 45 foot long trailer. I'd have to build another shop just to fit it in there. So that's not realistic. And this was always the plan was to leave it outside. So I'm gonna try this tarp idea and see if it works this winter. I mean, I guess worst case, I could clear a little more area here, bring in some more gravel, and then maybe build a, a Quonset temporary, well not temporary structure, but you know, like the Quonset huts that are tarp with pipes because that's not a, a formal structure. And because uh, where I am, the county won't allow me to build another shop, even if I had the money for it, which I don't. But that might be a decent idea gravel this whole area, build the Quonset, and then back the trailer underneath it. But for now, like I say, this will have to do. So I'll just keep stitching this thing together. I can't imagine the wind doing too much damage with it tarped at every point. But you never know, we do get some pretty good squalls going here in the winter time. I'm probably gonna have to retighten all these after once everything kind of gets itself straightened out. But that's okay. All right, I had to make a quick run to Home Depot. I needed a little more rope for the tarp, but I picked up some Gorilla Tape and some Poly as well. And what I was thinking of doing with this 
is to try and mask off, similar to what I did on the windshield, mask off the two openings here. Because of course, as I start to sand, I don't want to fill my nice interior of the cab and the, and the bunk with dirt and dust. So I'll go ahead and get that going. And that should just about wrap this bunk move up. Not the prettiest, but it should keep all the junk out of the cab. So with that, I think I've earned my treat. Ah, uh, oh, well, there you go. One step closer, at least now I can get going on, uh, on painting. Well, I'm painting yet, Mark, come on now. At least I can get going on the sanding and the bodywork. So hopefully in the next episode, I'll keep progressing and get a lot of this, uh, a lot of this rough paint off of here. There's still gonna be a lot of hours of work to get, uh, to get this smooth, smooth enough to put primer on, but I'll get there little by little. Yeah, a special shout out to John in Louisiana. Check this out. Look what he sent me. Isn't that nice? Louisiana Twin Six. So I will put that along with my other, actually I'm gonna have to start, I might have to make a wall of license plates because so many people are sending me awesome license plates. So I'll probably do that eventually in a future episode. But yeah, like I say, I'm gonna wrap the episode up there. Thanks for following along. Feel free to comment. Uh, hit the hit the thumbs up button down below. It helps drive the, the YouTube algorithm and gets it out to more people. And yeah, with that, I'll bid you farewell and hope to see you in the next episode. Oh yeah, and don't ever forget, if you got it, a trucker brought it. <laughs>